Henry, it's good to see you all. We've got a, just a great day to praise the Lord, to sing to Him. There is no darkness too great that your love cannot overtake. There is no stronghold too strong that your love cannot tear it down. burning on the inside There is a blood that's overcome Oh, King of kings, let your kingdom come Let every heart, let every soul praise you, Lord All of the earth, all of creation praise your name Along together this morning to praise the Lord and sing to Him. You are the God who restores. You just what word the world was for. You are the Spirit whose life is bursting forth like the dawn from night. You are the one who holds the key. Every battle is your victory. Yours is the blood that's overcome. Oh, King of kings, let your kingdom come. Let every heart, let every soul praise you, Lord. All of the earth, all of creation, praise your name. Sing that again, man. Let every let every soul praise you, Lord. All of the earth, all of creation, praise your name. And your light is brighter than the sun, it's stronger than the grave. Your light, your love has overcome the darkest of days. Your love is brighter than the sun, stronger than the grave. Your love, your love is overcome the darkest of days. Let every heart, let every soul praise you, Lord. So I'll sing it out together. All of the earth, all of creation, praise your name. Resurrection. 
Jesus Christ, heaven and earth declare all praise to Jesus Christ. Highly exalted is the name of Jesus Christ, heaven and earth declare all praise to Jesus. Sing it out. Every heart and tongue confess your name above all names. All things of this earth belong to you forever. You will reign. Jesus, Jesus, every heart and tongue confess your name. celebrating Palm Sunday. Many of you know this is the day we, we recognize in our church calendar as, as the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry into the city, riding on a, on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecies of Zechariah. And, you know, Jesus came all of those years ago to, to die. He knew he would die. He knew he would be offered up, crucified, killed, but because of his death, he was paying the debt for all of our sin so that we could be redeemed, we could be forgiven, we could be cleansed. And now, all of these years later, just as he brought that, that uh, life into Jerusalem as he brought himself, he also brings life into us. If we open our hearts and have received him, uh, the Lord brings salvation and forgiveness and redemption. So I would love for us just to take a moment right now. Perhaps if you'd like, you can you can bow your head before the Lord. And just in your own heart, if you would, just thank the Lord. Thank him for coming, for, for dying for our sins, for bringing hope. sacrifice for us really every day but especially uh, this week as we think on that
Lord, it is indeed our pleasure to bring all glory and honor and praise to you. To the depths of our heart, Lord, you have gone and you are working holiness into us, right perspectives, right thinking. Thank you for doing so. And Lord, part of that renewed mind is that mind and heart which love to give. You're teaching us that. So as we bring our tithes and offerings today, Lord, may it be with gladness and goodness of heart. Thank you. We could never earn all that you've done for us. Thank you that it's already been done by Jesus. And so not to gain favor with you, but out of grateful hearts, we give these tithes and offerings. Bless and receive them, we ask you. In Jesus' name, amen. Calvary Monterey, thank you very much for your giving. Please be seated, and the ushers will come. Stand as we sing this.
to celebrate today. Your word tells us, Lord, that you delight in us, not because of what we have done for you, not because of what we have accomplished for you, not because of what we could possibly offer you, but simply because of your incredible love for us. Lord, you you first loved us. And we're so thankful to be able to have the privilege of um, calling out to you and rejoicing in you and experiencing the joy of your presence together. Just incredible gifts from you, God. We don't want to take them for granted today, but we just um, thank you for them. And Lord, now as we prepare to hear from you and hear from your word, Lord, we want to have hearts that are open to you and and minds that are just seeking to, to hear from you. So Lord, we just pray you would speak to us today. You would move uh, through your power here with us this morning. We ask, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, as you take a seat, why don't you say hello to someone nearby as we continue. Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Monterey. We're so glad you're here. I'm Pastor Jeff, one of the assistant pastors here. And uh, if you're visiting and you're here for the first or maybe second time, we would sure love it if you have time to join us for just a moment afterward out the double doors to the right in the Welcome Center. We'd love to give you a a little gift and to uh, share with you some of what's happening here and perhaps help you just flow right into the life of community here Uh, small groups and things like that. So welcome. We're so glad that you're here. To the men who are here, a save the date for uh, September, April 30th. Not that far ahead. We are going to have a uh, one-day men's event, and it's going to be a time for men to come out and hear uh, Pastor Brian Stupar to share a study of the life of Jesus and how that may apply to us as men. What I've discovered when I go to a men's conference is I always make a friend that I have for years to come. Every time that's happened to me. And I encourage you to come and hear from this man how to really, really plug into Christ and be the man of God that your, that your family needs you to be and that you desire to be. So that's uh, April 30th. Hope you can save that day. And as you heard earlier, this is Easter week, Holy Week, Passion Week. If you were raised in a more liturgical church, you're very aware of that. And so it is a great week to meditate on all that God has done for us. So some of the opportunities, of course, would be Good Friday at 5 and 6.30. We've given you a little reminder card, which is really an outreach card for you to be able to hand this easily to someone. Walk over to a neighbor. I know I, I always do that. And say, you know, Good Friday service is a time we we traditionally remember the physical, emotional, spiritual suffering of our Lord for us. And uh, I'd like you to come with me. And so the restaurant will be open, and we would want to remind you of that opportunity this Friday. And then, of course, Easter. We all know what a blessing that can be. Easter sunrise service at 7 o'clock outside on the grass, and then 9, 11, and 630 a time to throw a victory party because Jesus, our Savior, defeated death, hell, the grave, rose again. Man, that's good news. And so when you can walk through this life free of the fear of death, 
as Romans 8 talks about, you can be a person who lives outside yourself and passionately pours your life out for others. So some of the favorite things we do around here is we have a, a huge Easter buffet. There will be limited food service, uh, some food available at 7, but at 9.30, this uh, Huge buffet opens up with ham and sausage and salads and all kinds of stuff. Something there for everybody. So love to have you consider making that part of your Easter tradition in your day. It's um, a day also that we always do water baptism. Right over here in this area, we take out some rows. And during the time of worship, we baptize people who have committed their lives to Christ. Baptism doesn't save you. It's not the way that you get saved. It's the way that you say, I am saved. It's the way that you publicly declare that you belong to Christ. It is, and everybody instinctively knows when it's happening. It is a very special time. So if you have not been baptized as a believing adult, if you'll go to calvary.com slash Easter, you can find a, an instructional video about what baptism is and also a place to sign up. Now, because we view this, uh, we are here to honor God, nurture believers, and proclaim to the world. And this is a, a great time for us to proclaim to our community and, in a sense, to our world how much we believe in Jesus. Well, we have a lot of extra people that show up, and sometimes even as many as twice the normal Sunday attendance. So that puts a blessed strain on some of the areas such as hospitality, greeters, and parking and all that kind of thing. Uh, Calvary Kids uh, downstairs and areas like that. So we want to encourage you to go to calvary.com slash Easter and sign up for an area. If you want to ask questions, you can head right out into the Welcome Center. Three of the ministry leaders of these areas where uh, more volunteers are needed will be there. And you could serve in the grill, Calvary Kids, hospitality, and be a part of just helping us in this day that Hopefully, just many, many people will visit and also come to faith in Christ. So be a volunteer, even if it's for a day, or perhaps you'd say, well, I'd, I'd be willing to begin regularly serving those areas. We would love to have that. It's very easy to sign up, but if you have questions, you want to find out, well, what would I do in the grill besides uh, sample the buffet? Uh, you can talk to uh, Dave Stam. He'll tell you about it. That's it in the way of announcements. Hope you have a great week. But for now, if you'll go to Romans chapter 4, we're going to study through again the book of Romans. Pastor Nate's going to come. If you don't have a Bible, please lift your hand. The ushers will bring you one as we study God's Word. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. This salvation is not accessed by the works of mankind, but by belief and trust in the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. But what is it we are to believe? What is this glorious gospel God has given a broken humanity? What has God provided? Together, let's learn more deeply of the provision of the gospel of grace. Right on. Good morning, everyone. You guys ready for a little Romans? Let's get into it. Romans chapter 4 is where we are uh, this morning, as Pastor Jeff mentioned. He just all day, he, every time he gives announcements, he's so pumped up about the buffet. That's like it just his thing. I just can't wait. To, I just want to go watch him eat the buffet is what I'm <laughs> looking forward to. It's going to be great next week. I'm really looking forward to, obviously, Easter Sunday. And, you know, Good Friday services are very meaningful to me in my own life and heart. And, uh, and then Easter Sunday, we've been having uh, sunrise services uh, here out on the grass for the last few years. Uh, but we always do our sunrise service at 7 a.m., which is sometimes problematic because usually Easter, the sun rises before 7 a.m. So we have sunrise services after the sun rises, but it's how we roll. So, <laughs> But this year I actually looked and the sun is going to rise at 7 a.m. Uh, next Sunday. And uh, that what that means is about 10 minutes after the official sunrise, it'll come over the hills and, and hit the grass out there. And uh, I just can't wait. You know, it's just a great way to start the day, just a beautiful day, honoring Jesus and uh, glorying in the reality of his uh, resurrection, which, of course, we glory in at all times uh, as 
believers. So really looking forward to it. Hey, before we get into um, Romans today, uh, we'll be in Romans 4, 13 to uh, 25. I want to share a little vision, kind of praise report, and a, a decision, uh, kind of directional thing that we're doing uh, together as a, a church. But this kind of stems from the reality that over the last um, couple of years as a church, we've just been steadily, slowly but surely, nothing you know crazy or anything like that, but we've just been steadily, slowly but surely, uh, growing numerically as a church uh, family. And there's a lot of different ways to uh, see that and everything uh, in the main sanctuary, in the children's uh, ministry, in our life groups. This uh, quarter that we're in right now, we've, uh, we've never had more people register for life groups than in this last quarter. So that's a blessing. We really rejoice uh, over all of that. And, and just so that you know, that's the kind of thing that I will rejoice over as long as we're able to declare the word of God, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without those elements. Uh, numerical growth really isn't all that impressive to me or exciting to me or anything like that. But if you have you know, Jesus being honored and glorified and proclaimed and the word being taught and the gospel being pronounced and people are into that, I'm excited about that. Okay, So that's a good thing and hopefully that's inside your uh, heart as well. And it kind of bears saying that because you know every new person that joins themselves to Calvary Monterey makes Calvary Monterey a little different. And when we go through things that you know, we are used to it one way and something becomes different, that can sometimes be uncomfortable for us. So uh, I just wanted to say that I'm rejoicing when that kind of thing uh, takes place. So the big deal is, uh, where does a lot of that numerical growth, where is it felt on a Sunday? You guys know on Sundays we have four services, 7.30 in the morning, 9 and 11, and then also tonight at 6.30 we also have a service. The numerical growth, though, is, you know, it's felt at 6.30 at night, it's felt at 7.30 in the morning, but it's honestly mostly felt at 9 and 11 because those are more traditional slots that more people will, you know, want to, you know, it's a, it's a rare breed that wants to come at 7.30 uh, in the morning, you know, and as, I mean, I'm talking to the 11 o'clock people, you guys understand this. <laughs> So a lot of people want to come at 9 and 11, which makes sense, okay? So uh, for us, what do we do you know, about that as a church? A lot of churches, if they're in the situation that we're in and kind of just like praying about it, thinking about the future and stuff, a lot of churches will uh, decide to maybe like build a new building or something like that, which we have land for, we have water for, we have permits for, we have all that kind of stuff, but... Uh, we don't have the money for it. And uh, also, I don't know that we, at least right now, would want to spend that kind of money on that kind of thing, especially when right down at the end of the patio, we have a second sanctuary uh, that is fully functional and beautiful and smaller than this one, not quite like the main sanctuary, but is wonderful. So what we're going to be doing now, starting next week and then continuing the weeks following, is we're going to be relaunching Sanctuary 2 uh, as a church. We've called it a lot of different things over the years, West Sanctuary, Overflow, Video uh, Sanctuary, stuff like that. None of those names accurately represent what we're trying to do right now. What we want to have is a legitimate second worship space as a uh, church. So I'm going to send uh, Riley Monzo as a worship leader with his band to go and be the worship leader there. And then I'm going to also send Pastor Matt Kaler, who you guys have come to know and love over the last few months. He's taught for me quite a bit. And he's going to go over there and uh, host the service, uh, you know, share with you guys a little bit, pray for people, and just kind of do the pastoral care for whoever feels called to be a part of that uh, environment. And for the most part, I'll continue to provide uh, the teaching because we have a video screen and all that kind of stuff, and so the screen will come down, and it's awesome because I'm seven and a half feet tall on the video screen, so <laughs> it's just very imposing. I like it. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and that, that will be the teaching. And there's a few different benefits of this. Obviously, I mentioned a major benefit is stewardship. God calls us to be good stewards of everything that he entrusts into our care. So our bodies, our finances, our schedules, our relationships, our families, our education, 
our jobs and careers, our callings. These are all things that God is asking us to be good stewards of. And for us as a church, it's good stewardship to use the space that God has already given to us for his purposes, for his honor and his glory uh, here on earth. But there's more benefits than just that, at least in my mind. Uh, A couple of other benefits would be uh, the development of future leaders. Uh, You guys know that I have a heart for it, and so as a church, we're developing and having a heart more and more for the planting of churches. So I want to continue to do that and send people out, and I think that that space, along with this space, is just a great place to develop and train and raise up generations of leaders who can go out and uh, plant churches. I also think, and here's to me one of the real beautiful things about doing a thing like this, is that what you find in some of these smaller um, gatherings of believers is you find a higher relational connectivity than you do in larger groups of believers gathering together. Now, you guys know that I'm a huge believer, we're a huge believer in the life group ministry of the church. It's the thing that I implore the church to get involved in. Come Sunday, absolutely, make that a part of your life. Honor the Lord with your life, with that seventh day. Honor Jesus in that way. Uh, However, no people and be with people, pray with people, no other believers. You can't do the one another Christian life without that experience. And so I'm always urging people, get yourself into a life group. But there is something cool also on Sundays about going to a worship environment that's a little smaller where you get to know each other a little bit better. And that's, I think, another benefit of the of sanctuary too, is a little bit of a smaller environment for people to worship the Lord in, uh, receive his word, but then also So after the service is over with, like hang out and be together and spend time together. It's part of the reason why we have a grill. It's part of the reason why we have a big old patio and all of that is so that, you know, I know a lot of you like to make the like sprint to your car after the service is over with, you know, but okay, but it's really cool when you can get to the place of saying like, I'm going to like talk with people and meet people and spend time with people and sometimes in a little bit smaller of an environment that happens uh, a little bit more and then also i think there's the benefit of like for a lot of you this is your church and you need to become a part of your church by using some of your gifts a little bit more even on sundays so some of that will be expressed in life groups and all of that but Uh, you know, when you have a second sanctuary, more people get an opportunity to say yes to serving Jesus in some of the practical ways that it takes to serve him. So welcoming, sound, tech, musicians, a lot of different things like that. So I'm stoked about it. And this is where we're going over the, you know, next months as a church. And so what I wanted to do, kind of what in my uh, thinking, at least in my mind, I just was thinking, you know, if we were sending these guys to go to downtown Monterey or to go to Marina to plant a church, to start a church, I would drag them up on the platform and I would put hands on them and we would pray for them uh, as a church. So I'm going to do that uh, this morning. So Matt and Riley, come on up here and let's all stay. Stand up. Let's cheer for these guys because they're awesome. Stop clapping. Okay, that's too long. Okay. (laughs) That was like the longest. (laughs) Uh, I'm so happy because Riley put his orange Mr. Rogers sweater back on. I love it. He didn't have it on at 9 o'clock, but I requested it. So... I'm just going to pray for these guys. Part of the reason that I want these guys to go do this is because I, I love them and I trust them. And I really believe in what God is doing in and through their lives. I see the hand of God upon their families, upon their marriages, upon the men that God has made them to be. And I really believe that they're going to do an excellent job both now and in the years to come. So let's pray and ask the Lord's uh, blessing. Father, we thank you and we ask, Lord, for your good hand of grace and mercy to be upon, Lord, this uh, environment, Lord, this uh, expression, Lord, of our church body and family. 
And Lord, I pray that what would increase as a result of this would be, Lord, ownership of our own church family, that we would not feel that I go to that church, but that we would begin to say more and more, that is my church. That is my home. That is my family of believers. And I pray, Lord, for Matt and Riley, that your spirit would flow through them uh, right on into that room and environment that people would feel just loved and cared for and blessed and taught and instructed and nurtured or more and more in their life and walk with Jesus. So I pray, Lord, for these men that you'd just continue your excellent work, Lord, in their lives and that you'd bless them, Lord, in a great way. And we just pray, Father, for this uh, whole thing um, you know, Lord, we just all understand that we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't know what the future holds for us as a church. We're just praying, Lord, that this would be, um, that it would take, that it be embraced and received, Lord, within the community, within the body here, if it be, Lord, your will. And so we thank you, Lord. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll get them. Yep. So I forgot to mention uh, that um, the thing that I'm asking you to do in this is um, I'm asking you, one, to pray and ask the Lord, is this something you want me to be a part of and a place that you want me to make as my uh, kind of place that I go to on Sundays, worship the Lord and, and be with him and, and uh, be with other believers? And pray about that. And I'm actually looking for what I, what I would love personally is if uh, one out of every five of you uh, made that decision. All right. So I'm going to stand at the door after service and I'm just going to count it out. Okay. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five. You got to go. No, we're not going to do that. But um, that's what I'd love for you to pray about. And then, uh, you, you know, just go check it out. You know, that's all you need to do. You just go check it out, and it might just be something that it's like, okay, yeah, cool. I, I get this. I, I, I'm connected to this. And uh, for a lot of you, if you would check it out on Easter Sunday, it would be helpful because you probably noticed that last year we added a bunch of services to Easter Sunday, and this year we're like, we're not doing that again. So uh, we're, we just kept the same service times, basically, uh, for Easter Sunday. So that means probably a lot of us will need to uh, actually engage in the service in the sanctuary, too, uh, next week for Easter Sunday. So it might be a good day for you to check it out, all right? Okay, Romans chapter chapter 4. That's where we're at today, Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> okay, last week we, uh, you know, saw that God made a huge promise to Abraham. That was w- what Paul is focusing on here in Romans chapter 4, a huge promise to Abraham. He went to this guy, Abraham, in Genesis 12. He says, I'm going to make you the father of nations. Through you, through your seed, All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. He said to him, from you, kings are going to flow. He said to him progressively over the years, through you and Sarah, your offspring will be a blessing to all of the world. And your descendants are going to be for you like the stars in the sky and like the sand on the seashore. You're going to have an innumerable uh, impact here on earth. God made these massive promises to Abraham. And Abraham, as Paul quoted earlier in in, uh, Romans 4, uh, Abraham, he believed God. God made him this insane promise And Abraham believed God, Genesis uh, chapter 15 tells us, and it was accounted to him, imputed to him, added to him, credited to him for righteousness. So God made the big promise, something that Abraham could never do. And he says, this is what I'm going to do for you, Abraham. And Abraham heard all that, and belief entered into his heart, and he says, I believe that. I believe that you're going to do that for me. So why is Paul focusing on that right now? Well, the reason that he's focusing on that right now is because in the first three chapters of Romans, he lays out this train wreck of news and says the world is so lost. We're under the wrath of God. We're so fallen and broken and despairing and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet, 
There is like a gift that God will give, the gift of righteousness, approval, acceptance, worth. He'll say, I receive you for those who believe that Jesus became the propitiation for the wrath of God, that he satisfied the wrath of God, that in his body on the cross of Calvary, he died for the sin of the world. And we receive by believing in that and that he rose from the grave, the righteousness of God, which includes the redemption of God, the justification uh, from God. We receive all of this by simply just believing in it. So it's this huge promise that God makes, just like he made a huge promise to Abraham, he makes a huge promise to us, and then we, like Abraham, it's for us to then say, I believe that. I believe that. I receive it. I believe it. And as we believe it, just like Abraham, it was accounted to him for righteousness, we also receive the righteousness of God by simply believing in what God said he would do or that he has done in Christ on the cross uh, for you uh, and for me. So it's really powerful what the point that Paul uh, is making. So he kind of continues that theme here in this section of Romans chapter 4. And what he's going to do is he's going to talk to us about where our faith is taking us, where it's going, what we get by faith. And then he's going to talk to us a little bit about the originator, the original faith, the faith of Abraham. Now, when he does that, he's not going to do that in order to intimidate us or to discourage us. That really isn't the point. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, maybe looking at the faith of people in the Bible. You know, like when Jesus looked at Peter and said, you know, uh, and Peter says, if that's you walking on the water, command me to come out of the boat and I will come, you know. And Jesus says, it's I, you know, come out, don't be afraid. And Peter gets out of the boat, he begins to walk on water. People like to rip on Peter for eventually beginning to drown, but it's a very very impressive to me that he got out of the boat. I probably would have been one of the, those 11 guys just like, we're having a debate on whether that's a ghost or not out there. And you're just saying like, if you say it's you, I'll come. Like, well, this seems like a ghost would do, we would mess with you, you know, kind of thing. And so he did it. I mean, that's impressive stuff. And maybe in times like that, you're um, intimidated by that kind of faith. But that's really not why Paul is going to talk to us about Abraham's original faith. He's actually encouraging us that the same kind of faith that he had to enter into the righteousness of God is the kind of faith that we've had if you've believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And now we, like Abraham, can be growing in our faith uh, because that's what this is all about. That's what he said in Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. The, the, he's not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. So there's faith gets you in, but then you keep living by the same way you got in. You get in by faith, but you keep living by faith. And that's why then he says, for it's written, the just shall live by faith. So we're to be walking by faith, and it's a growing faith as we trust uh, the Lord and walk uh, with him. So let's take a look at this, starting out in verse uh, 13. He says, for the promise to Abraham uh, and his offspring. So you see that there, verse 13. The promise, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, this is interesting on a bunch of levels, but part of the reason that it's interesting to us today, and I'll just remind you of this, but last week we saw at the, in the passage right before this that Paul declared that Abraham is the father of faith for everyone who believes. He believed when he was still technically Gentile. He believed before he'd been circumcised. He believed, obviously, 400 plus years before the law had been given to the nation of Israel. So because of the timeline of his belief, he's the father of faith for everyone, not just Israelites, but for every person who had ever placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So, as a result, when he says in verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring when he says offspring, he's not just talking about Jews in this verse. He's talking about you and me if we've believed in the Lord. And we're going to see that in the verses to come. But So that's why this is, catches my attention because he says, 
that he would be heir of the world. That's a like massive promise. You and I could go around saying to our children like, oh, but daddy's going to give you the world. But like, dude, that's not going to happen. But God spoke to Abraham and said, you'll be heir of the world. And it wasn't just a promise to him, it was a promise to his offspring. Now, when you actually look at all the promises that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 15, 17, and 22, when you look at all four of those chapters, you discover that actually you don't have an implicit uh, or, excuse me, an explicit promise from God that he would be the heir of the entire world. But it's implied. And it's implied through Jesus, that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. When Jesus comes, Jesus becomes the, the one who wins and, and becomes the preeminent heir of the whole world. And then when you believe in Jesus, you become a co-heir with Christ. So this is like our future, okay? This is a good thing for us to consider and to think about, that a day is coming. You know, Jesus came uh, the first time, went into Jerusalem. They put down the palm branches. That's what we uh, remember on Palm Sunday. Uh, and he went in, and then he left, and then a week later he was crucified, uh, or five days later was crucified, and a week later rose from the grave. But Jesus made a promise that he would return. And when he returns, he will rule and reign with a rod of iron. All of the world will be his. And then the earth as we know it will melt away as a fervent heat, uh, with fervent heat. And a new heavens and a new earth will come. And we, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, we are heirs of that. So like what Paul's doing is he's saying, remember Abraham, really big promise. How did he get it? By simply believing. A really big promise to you and to me as well. How do we get it? By simply believing. Let's go on and see what Paul continues to say. He says, for it is the adherents, verse 14, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise void. For the law brings wrath. So anytime you have laws and requirements, the wrath comes because you become guilty of those laws. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. So in other words, he's just saying we cannot become heirs of the world by adhering to the law. It comes by faith. That is why, verse 16, it depends on faith in order that, look at this in verse 16, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Now read the next line with me, because some of you might be saying, I don't think that I'm part of this whole heir of the world kind of thing, or this offspring kind of thing. I don't think that's me as a believer in Jesus. But notice what he says there in verse 16. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, not the uh, genealogy of Abraham or the ancestry of Abraham, but the faith of Abraham, who is, he says, the father of us all. So Paul looks at the Roman church and says that as a believer, because you share the faith of Abraham, he is your father uh, in a sense. Not, of course, in a physical sense, and we're going to deal with that when we get to Romans 9, 10, and 11. What about physical Israel? But here he's looking at them and he's saying, you guys are ancestors of Abraham or descendants of Abraham because you believed. Like Abraham believed a, ma a massive promise, so you have believed a massive promise from God and you have entered into uh, the justification that God wants to give to you by uh, faith. But notice this in verse 16. He says, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. If approval before God comes through your doing good, being a righteous person, trying to be obedient, if all of that comes that way, then the word that you can never apply is the word guaranteed. That's the word that Paul uses, though. He says it comes, it rests on grace that it might be guaranteed. Technically speaking, we would say it this way. We actually 
are not saved by faith. We are saved by grace and God's grace. And we receive it through faith. In other words, we just add all these huge things that God says, I will do this, I will do that, I will promise this, I will make that happen, I will you know, have the blood of my son shed for you, I will do all of this for you, and you will enter into this gift, this grace, by faith. And what we need to notice here is that Abraham, he, it says in verse 17, he says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Abraham, when he believed, he was not concentrating on himself or his own belief. He was concentrating on God and just saying, that's what you've done for me? Okay, I'll believe that. And the reason that's important is because it's crazy how the human mind works, but we hear this beautiful message that God did all of this and you enter into it by simply believing it or receiving it. And we hear all of that message. And you know the human mind, what we like to do is we like to figure out a way to turn faith, belief, into works where we get so like wrapped up inside the self and going, is my faith legit enough? Is my faith strong enough? Is my faith potent enough? Is my faith really real? And we turn from having a focus on the God who made these ridiculous promises to us and we turn the focus back on the self. And we basically use the word faith, but really the definition we're importing into it is not reception, receiving faith, but we're actually putting words like works, law, I must be into the word faith. But that's not the way Abraham had it. He just put his eyes on God and he says, I believe this, it's all grace, and so it's guaranteed for me. And that is a beautiful place to live before God. Because when you don't have a guarantee, man, your life before God is so shaky, isn't it? If you're feeling that you need to uh, earn your approval in the sight of God, now what does that do to your everyday experience before him? You know, you get up, maybe you open up the Bible and you begin to read it, which is a beautiful thing to do. I, th I think every Christian should do it. You read the Bible, you meditate upon it, you think about the word of God. You wanna see what your Father in heaven is saying to you directly. It's a great thing. But if you wake up in the morning and you read the Bible and you're like, oh, I've just spent half an hour reading the Bible and, you're, and then you begin feeling like, now God likes me. Now I have his worth. Now I have his righteousness. That is such shaky ground. Because the second that you think an impure thought, the second that you get angry with you know, your neighbor, the second that you're less than holy or spiritual, the second any of that happens, you then, that, that foundation that you're standing on just crumbles. But when you're standing on a foundation of grace, man, it's beautiful to read the Bible like that. It's beautiful to pray like that. It's beautiful to obey God like that because you know the foundation that you are already standing on. And so Paul says it this way, the promise must rest on grace. And because it is, it is guaranteed to all of his uh, offspring. Now, in verse 18, Paul then goes on and he inspects the faith of Abraham. Now, like I told you, this isn't meant to intimidate us, although it might a little bit, but the main purpose of Paul is to say, this is the faith that Abraham had. This is the kind of faith that you and I can also enter into because if you're a believer, you already have, and so you just want to continue growing uh, in this uh, kind of faith. So let's take a look at Abraham's faith in verse 18 to 22. It says, verse 18, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring uh, be. Now, when you track the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis, what you discover is there were a lot of moments where this guy could have easily run out of hope. And especially like human 
hope. Because he got older, and his wife got older, and they just weren't having any kids. And as they advanced in age, it kind of got to a point where they realized this is only going to be possible with God. We're going to need a little bit of a miracle here. And so he had what is said there in verse 18, hope that he believed against hope. What does that mean? I think what Paul is saying there is that there is a human version of hope, and then there's hope that comes from God. When Abraham was younger and maybe first received the promises, he might have been able to have like a human version of hope. And I I think this will happen. I I believe that this will happen. But things got to a point for for Abraham and Sarah, his wife, where it was just this, I, I don't have any human hope anymore. I only have God hope. I only have divine hope. The thing about human hope is that it only goes so far, but hope in God goes all the way. And notice what it says. It says he hoped in what he'd been told. In other words, as believers, we simply are placing our hope in God and trusting the things that he has spoken over us. So part of Abraham's faith is simply that he hoped in what he'd been told. This is part of the reason that the Bible is so important in your everyday experience with God, because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and that by the word of God. So if there's a famine of God's word in your own life personally, it'll be really hard for that hope to develop because you don't have anything that you've been told, like Abraham did, that you can have hope in. So you have to be told continually by the Lord so that your faith can grow. But notice also in verse 19 it says, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. And then Paul gets super blunt when he says, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So the thing about Abraham is that apparently he like got to this point where he's almost 100 years old or about 100 years old. His wife was about 90 years old. And he's just looking around. And what Paul says is he did not when he considered his body. It's not that he didn't consider it. He did. But when he considered it, uh, he uh, did not, verse 19, weaken in faith. He believed that the Lord could still work. In other words, Abraham, he saw his limitations, but he believed God in the middle of those limitations. Or to put it another way, he saw that his limitations were actually God's opportunity. And you know, when you grow in your walk with the Lord and you're growing in faith, you begin to discover more and more that it's actually your limitations that are actually an opportunity for God to work in your life. Uh, You know, like for instance, when Jesus fed the 5,000, you know, they looked at this crowd of people, probably fifteen to 20,000 people in total. It was 5,000 men plus women and children. But they looked out at this crowd of people, and the disciples said, Lord, send them away, that they can go and buy something to eat. You know, we don't have anything for them. But Jesus said, well, what do you have? Give that to me. And they rustled up five loaves of bread and two fish. That is a limitation, when it comes to, to, to feeding, you know, like a, a stadium's worth of people, five loaves and two fish is not going to go very far. Okay, so they bring that to Jesus. They bring their limitation to Jesus. And Jesus takes it, blesses it, breaks it, and multiplies it in his hands. And with Jesus, their limitation was actually enough for the problem. And so often in our lives, our limitations are the very things that God wants to use to actually uh, be an opportunity for him to work and move through our lives. Like in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, he came to this place in his own life. He wrote to the Corinthians about it in 2 Corinthians. And he said, you know, I had a vision of heaven And this vision of heaven was powerful and beautiful. I heard things that it would be unlawful for me to utter. And he comes 
out of that vision, he, the vision was so strong for Paul that he said, I don't know if I was there or if I was not there, but I, it was very strong. And he said, I came out of that vision and lest I be puffed up and you know, boast about this vision that I received of heaven, God gave me a, a thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. People argue about it, and some people act like they just totally know exactly what the thorn in the flesh was, but it, we don't really know. When we get to heaven, I'm going to ask Paul, like, what was your thorn in the flesh? And we might be surprised, you know, it might have been like a person. But uh, he, he doesn't say, he just said, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, he said, to buffet me. Was it spiritual, physical, we don't know, it might have been an eyesight thing, but he says, I had this thing. He says, I prayed to the Lord three times that he would take it from me. And the Lord didn't. And eventually, Jesus spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And when Paul heard that from Jesus, he got a new mission statement for his life. And he said, so, I have made a determination that I'm going to boast in my infirmities, that I'm going to glory in my limitations and my weaknesses and in my sicknesses and all of that. I'm going to glory in it because it's in my weakness that he is strong because his grace is sufficient for me. And any time that you see God working in a person's life, using a person's life, more often than not, you're seeing a person who's come to a place of realizing a limitation in their own hearts, but they stepped out in obedience anyways. And Abraham saw that limitation, but he still believed God in the midst of that limitation. Some of you are here today, and you're, you're feeling like, I could never be that for this person in my life. I could never be the answer that they're looking for. I could never be the spouse that they need. I could never be the friend that they need. I could never be, I could never be used by the Lord in this kind of way. And the Lord is looking at you and saying, it's good that you've realized a limitation in your own strength, but now you need to glory in my power and in my might in the midst of your limitation. Don't wait for the limitation to go away. Believe me in the midst of that limitation. That was the kind of faith that Abraham had. He did not consider the weakness of his own body. Notice also, though, in verse 20, it says, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. You have to think about what it was like to be Abraham. I think that probably there were many moments that it was embarrassing to be Abraham. The name Abram, his original name, means uh, exalted father. And the name Abraham, who God gave him that name, means father of nations. So you got this guy for a long time in his life, he cruises up and people say, hey, what's your name? He says, my name is exalted father. And like the next question would be, oh, I can't wait to meet your children. And then he'd have to say, well, I, that I don't have any. That hasn't happened. Oh, but your name's exalted father. How ironic. That's funny, you know, kind of thing. And then God, you know, after years maybe of Abram being like, God, why, why, why the name exalted father? God says, I'm going to give you a new name. And he's like, oh, that'd be awesome because this has been really awkward. And God says, your new name is going to be Abraham. God, that's worse. Father of nations. I don't even have one child and you're naming me Father of nations, you know, like I think it's an embarrassing thing. Like yesterday I was watching the Warriors uh, play on TV and this guy, a warrior, he shot the ball and it was an air ball. And in basketball, what an air ball is, it means you shoot it and the, you don't, the ball doesn't even hit the rim. It's not just that you miss, it's that you miss hard. It doesn't even hit the rim. And there's this thing, it's so horrible. It's like the most mortifying moment in sports to me. But where like in every you know, arena known to man, when the opposing team shoots an air ball, everybody just spontaneously starts chanting, Air ball, air ball. It's horrible. I've been there. I've experienced it. It's a bad feeling. 
And then I saw it yesterday happen in professional sports, you know, thousands of people in San Antonio ch- chanting, air ball. Abraham's name was like the air ball of names, you know? Just like, there's nothing there. I have no children, I have no offspring. I'm called exalted father, father of nations. It was embarrassing. Yet in the middle of all of that, he did not waver at the promise that God had made to him. God declares incredible, dare I say, impossible truths over his people. He says to believers, you were in Adam, now you are in Christ. You were in death, and now you are in life. You were in darkness, now you are in light. You were enslaved to sin, but now you are a slave of righteousness in my sight. He declares all of these things about us. He says, you are going to a future with me called heaven. You are mine. Your inheritance in my mind is so firm that according to Ephesians, he says, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places in my sight right now. That's like a wild thing to believe. You see, it's not embarrassing. It's not embarrassing at all to become a really good person who then proclaims, I think God will receive me because I'm a good person. That's not embarrassing. Our culture receives it. Our culture accepts it. Yeah, look at you. You're generally very good. You're ge- generally very generous and very kind and very thoughtful. You're a good person. I can't imagine God judging a person like you. But it's embarrassing when you consider who you really are in the privacy of your own heart and you come to the place where you agree with the Bible and you say, like Abraham, I in my flesh am dead. In me dwells no good thing. I am dead in trespasses and sins. And God saw me like that. And as I just believed his promises, he changed me. And he says, this is who you now are in my sight. That is very often a very hard thing to believe God for. And Abraham, he just said, you say these things about me. I believe these things. I will not waver in this promise that you have made over my life. He did not cons- when he considered his body, he did not get stuck there, but he considered the Lord and he did not lower his expectations of what God would do in his life. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise. As he verse 20 gave glory to God. If you want your faith to grow, give glory to God. If you want your faith to increase, worship God. If you want to be able to more successfully walk by faith and not by sight, Spend time with God, sing to God, get your focus upon God. The place that my faith decreases the most is when I think about myself. Someone asked me recently, should I meditate? Should I go inward? Should I think about the self? Should I go inward? And I said, no, 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 a thousand times no. That's not where you need to go. You need to go up, not in. You need to go to God. You need to be thinking about God, setting your mind upon him, your heart upon him, your devotion towards him. Because as you do and you see the greatness and the glory of God, then your faith grows as well as you see who God truly is. And he, verse 21, became fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham came to a place where he was fully convinced. It says in verse 20 that he grew strong in his faith. It says in verse 21 that he became fully convinced in his faith. When did that happen in Abraham's life? When was he fully convinced? Well, I think that where you see that most fully is in Genesis chapter 22. By then, Isaac had been born. He had had a child. Isaac was now at least a teenager, if not a full-grown man. And God spoke to Abram and said to him, Take your son Isaac, your only son Isaac, whom you love, to Mount Moriah, and offer him there as a sacrifice to me. Now, at the end of the day, God wasn't going to require that Abraham sacrifice Isaac. When the knife was raised, 
God would speak to Abraham and say, no, don't do it. And we're horrified by the, even the request of it, and that's good. It should help us understand that what Jesus did for us was horrible in a sense. He is the one who shed his blood. He is the son who actually died. God never required a human sacrifice from any of us, but he gave his only begotten son for you and for me. But when Abraham was doing all of that, what was going through his mind? Well, it tells us in Hebrews, it tells us that he had heard the promise of God. God had said, through Isaac, your seed will be blessed. The promises, all these huge promises I've made, they come through Isaac. And he looked at Isaac, and he realized Isaac doesn't have any children. And so Isaac has to have kids for this promise to be fulfilled. So what it tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 is that with that promise in his mind, Abraham believed that if necessary, God would raise Isaac back from the dead in order to fulfill the promise that he'd made. In other words, Abraham was more confident at that stage in his life in the word of God and the promise of God that was more real to him than the heartbeat of his own son. That's incredible faith. But it took a lot of time in years for his faith to develop to that. In fact, some of you are probably sitting here this morning going like, now wait a minute. Like, I read the book of Genesis. I saw the times when Abraham went down to Egypt and the kings in Egypt were like, hey, who's that that you're traveling with? Because Sarah apparently was a beautiful woman and Abraham was a little afraid that they were gonna kill him in order to take his wife. And so he said like, well, like she's my sister. Don't kill me so that you can have her. Like maybe you read about those times or you read about the time when Sarah comes to him and says, you know, sweetie, I'm getting old. It's very clear. We're not going to have a child. This promise is not going to come to pass through me, but maybe you you should go into my maidservant Hagar and have a child with her and her child will be the one that fulfills the promises of God. And Ishmael was born and God rejected Ishmael. That was not the way the promise was going to be fulfilled. And maybe you've read those things and right now you're saying, come on, like Paul's being really generous. This is, by the way, the way the whole New Testament is. The false and the stumblings of the Old Testament saints are just not in there. God looks at these guys and he's like, the faith, the faith was awesome. The faith was legit. The faith was so strong. And I think that should be encouraging because God, I think, looks at his people with these like crazy grace-colored glasses, these lenses where he's like, look at that faith. You know, and Abraham's like, I really don't feel like I got it right now. Like, do you even know about Ishmael? Because God says to Abraham, he says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. He's like, I don't even see it. I don't even see it. Abraham's faith, though, it grew to that point. It grew to that point. It began, he just said, I hear these promises, I believe them, and it grew to this incredible point. And that's where it's to go in our own lives as well. That's why, verse 22, his faith was counted to him as righteousness. It was real, legit faith. It grew and it grew and it grew. It developed, it developed, it developed. And this is how we are to continue to live before God. We are to be walking by faith. God makes a promise. We believe it. This is a continual interaction uh, with the Lord. So this is how Paul applies this whole connection to Abraham. Verse 23. But if the words, excuse me, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone. But, verse 24, for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Abraham received a massive promise. He believed it. We do too. What is the massive promise we are given from God that we should believe in? It's very simple. Verse 25 that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses. What you come to a place of is you just agree. You say, my sin, my judgment, my wrath that I deserved 
that, that was coming to me, my guilt, it was placed upon Jesus when he was delivered up to death and when he rose from the dead, my justification was sealed. And what Paul is announcing boldly and really gloriously seems to me that he's saying that was the faith Abraham had and it just developed into a really awesome walk before God. And if you had this kind of faith before God where you believed in the gospel, then you have done the, you have, you have taken a massive step and you have believed in this really incredible thing that God has done for you. So you've kind of done the hard part of faith already. So just continue in the walk of faith that he has uh, for you. And the life of faith in trusting the Lord and his promises is an electric kind of life. And so I wanted to close by reading to you the original call that God placed upon Abraham. And the reason I'm doing this is because a lot of times when dryness comes into your Christian life and experience, if you've been born again, a lot of times when dryness comes is when God says to you, do this, take this step of faith, and you don't. And what happens is he just waits. He waits for you to go back to that point and to just walk in the thing that he asked you to do, that step of faith that he wanted you to take. And when you go back to that, the great joy and blessing comes in as you live that thing that he has called you to live. So let's listen to the word that God spoke to Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. That was the first word that he heard from God. Go. 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 So this isn't like my sneaky way to try to get anybody to go to Sanctuary 2 or something like that. <laughs> I just know that over and over again in our own hearts, our Father, by His Spirit, in different areas of our lives, He says, go. That thing, go. That person, go. That conversation, go. That responsibility, go. That ministry, go. That volunteering of yourself, go. That thing, go. And when we dry up when we say no. But the walk of faith says more and more, yes, I'll go, I'll go. So however that applies into your own heart and life, say yes to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you because you've, <clears throat> you've loved us and you've blessed us. You've given us, Father, such a beautiful opportunity Lord, here to walk with you. And Father, we pray and we ask, Lord, this morning that you would strengthen this faith, Lord, of ours. That you would develop us in faith and that you would help us, Lord, to walk by faith. Lord, we pray that you would give us a real strength, Lord, in it. That you would grow, Lord, this faith of ours. And maybe just in your heart this morning, you might say to the Lord, Lord, I believe, yet help my unbelief. Lord, strengthen this faith that resides inside of me. Mm. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we love you and thank you this morning. Grow, Father, we pray, this faith of ours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, church, let's stand and sing this closing song to Jesus, honoring him and worshiping him for who he is.
bless you guys. Enjoy life groups this week and we'll see you Friday night. Some good Friday services. If I run far, far away.